Greetings and welcome to my presentation on global warming, hoax or real. I want to say up front that I am not a professional climate researcher. I am a concerned citizen with a background in science that wanted to understand the facts, so I undertook a study of the subject of global warming for myself. What you are going to see is my personal journey of discovery. I want you to know that I am aware that the topic of global warming is controversial and political. This PowerPoint presentation is a condensed version of a longer presentation that I have converted to a video for YouTube. As such, many important details have been briefly stated at several points I will ask you to pause the video to look over details. I have done this to reduce the upload time of this video. This presentation is not entertaining, but I hope you will find it informative. Be patient, listen, and learn. I want to start this presentation by giving you an overview of the topics that will be covered. In Topics 1 and 2, I discuss the two fundamental pieces that are the underlying basis for an understanding of global warming. These are the greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases. In Topics 3 and 4, I switch gears to cover the second most important topic, that of global temperature. Is it really increasing? In Topic 5, I will consider the three most commonly mentioned natural causes of climate change, the sun, changes in Earth orbit, and volcanoes. Are they the cause? In Topic 6, I'm going to backtrack to take another look at the greenhouse gases. You will learn about global warming potential and radiative forcing. These two topics are seldom made mention of in the news or the press. However, they are very revealing. In Topic 7 and 8, I will show data about how much of the greenhouse gases in particular carbon dioxide, humans are putting into the Earth's climate system. To close this presentation in Topic 9, I show you the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCCs, their global temperature projections for the years 2050 and 2100. You decide, is global warming a hoax or is it real? Topic 1, the greenhouse effect. While you look at this figure, I want to make some comments about the greenhouse effect because it is at the very base of an understanding of global warming. From what I have read, it appears to me that this natural phenomenon is well understood and I could not find any papers, nor have I ever heard anyone say that the greenhouse effect is not real. Having said that, I want to give you an example of how it works. Imagine it's a hot summer day, say 95 degrees Fahrenheit. You decide to go to the mall and do some shopping. You pull out of your garage, arrive at the mall, and park your car under that overbearing sun. After three or four hours of shopping, you decide to head home. What do you notice when you open the car door? you get a rush of hot air. I tested this once with a thermometer I left in the car. The temperature outside was about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. I opened the door and got in. The thermometer read 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the greenhouse effect works in a similar fashion. The Earth's atmosphere is like the windshield of a car. The sun's energy shines through and its energy is released as heat energy. Because of the nature of heat energy, it cannot escape back through the windshield. The Earth's atmosphere, like the windshield, traps some of the sun's energy here on the planet. Now let's look at figure one. On the left, we see a representation of the Earth's atmosphere in 1750, before the start of the Industrial Revolution and on the right what the atmosphere might look like today if we could actually see the greenhouse gases. 
On the right, the atmosphere is shown as much redder, apparently caused by an increase in the chemical compounds carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, suggesting that they are the cause of the increasing temperatures via the greenhouse effect. The numbers. During this presentation, you will see many sets of data so from the start, I want you to get used to focusing on the numbers because they are very important. So here is your first look at some numbers. You can pause the video to read over the details. Topic 2, the greenhouse gases. Climate researchers have been saying for years that the planet is warming. What you and I want to know is what is causing it to warm. As we just discussed, energy from the sun heats the earth. If the earth is warming, we might expect that more of the energy coming from the sun may be staying here on the planet. We have just seen that this heating could be caused by the greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So a better understanding of global warming must include knowledge of the greenhouse gases. Definition A greenhouse gas is a gas in the atmosphere that absorbs energy from sunlight and emits that energy as heat energy here on Earth. Table 1 The first three gases in Table 1 are considered to be the major greenhouse gases. In 2014, their atmospheric concentrations were CO2 at 400 parts per million by volume, methane at 1.9 parts per million, and nitrous oxide at 330 parts per billion. At the bottom, I have included data about two non-greenhouse gases, nitrogen and oxygen. Most people know these are the two most abundant atmospheric gases, so you can use them for comparison. You can pause the video to familiarize yourself with the other information in Table 1. If the greenhouse gases are playing a role in global warming, we need to know if their atmospheric levels are increasing. Look at Table 2. The levels of the greenhouse gases in 1755 are their pre-industrial levels. This reflects a long-term balance between natural processes that produce greenhouse gases and those that take up greenhouse gases from the Earth's climate system. From the table, we can see clearly see that their atmospheric levels over the past 240 years has been increasing. Common sense suggests to me that based on our understanding of the greenhouse effect, a natural phenomenon, and the observation that the levels of the greenhouse gases has been increasing since 1755, we should suspect that the Earth's temperature must be increasing. While this is not an absolute certainty, it does suggest that the greenhouse gases may at least in part be involved in global warming. You can pause the video to look over Table 2. Temperature Anomalies Before proceeding to Topic 3, I need to introduce you to the subject of temperature anomalies because climate researchers use them repeatedly, and I will be using them as well. <clears throat> Simply put, a temperature anomaly is a departure from a mean or base period. While there are several temperature means in use, one of the most common is the 30-year period from 1951 to 1980. The average global temperature for this time was 14 degrees Celsius, or 57.2 degrees Fahrenheit. To plot temperature data, this period is used as the 0 degrees Celsius point on the y-axis of graphs of temperature versus time. You will see this type of graph on the next slide. To determine the actual temperature in real numbers, 
All you have to do is add or subtract the anomaly from the mean base period temperature. I have worked out an example on the slides that come after you have seen the graph on the next slide. Topic 3. Current Trends in Global Warming Now let's see what the temperature of Earth is doing. In Figure 3, we can see one of many graphs about the trends in temperature. If we take the data shown here at face value, what that is, we consider it to be in a general sense correct or close to being so, and we can surmise that the trend in global temperature is upward. From the reading I have done, there are several issues related to how this data is obtained and analyzed, but for the sake of brevity, I will not discuss them here. You will notice that the annual mean, the black line, goes up and down over periods of years to decades. This can be caused by such things as El Nino, La Nina events, large volcanic eruptions, and atmospheric and ocean current variations. Details for Figure 3. The current global temperature trend is upward. Consider a low point in 1880 of about minus two tenths of degrees Celsius from the graph and a high point in 2014 at about plus 0 0.65 degrees Celsius. This is an overall increase of 0 0.85 degrees Celsius or 1.53 degrees Fahrenheit since about 1880. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change considers an increase of 2 degrees Celsius to be the warning zone and an increase of 3 degrees Celsius to be the danger zone. Think globally. On this slide and the next one, I show you how to use temperature anomalies. This slide shows you how to change temperature anomalies into actual degrees Celsius. You can pause the video to read over the information. The second part, how to change degrees Celsius into degrees Fahrenheit temperatures, which are which we are more familiar with. Again, you can pause the video to look over the details. Topic 4. Historical temperatures from climate proxies. A fairly good temperature record is only about 150 years long. It is not a real convincing one because of the issues I alluded to previously. We need to be certain that what is happening now is significant and not just run-of-the-mill climate variation. What we need is a way to look further back in time. To extend the temperature record, climate researchers use climate proxies. Climate proxies are preserved physical characteristics of the past that stand in for direct measurements of the climate conditions that prevailed during much of Earth's history. Here are some examples of climate proxies. There are several. The one that most of us are pro have probably heard about are tree rings. Due to the presence of rings, we can see changes from year to year. However, good tree ring data only extends back in time about 2,000 years. We would like to have a much longer record. One of the longest records of past climate comes from ice cores. While ice cores have been drilled in many parts of the globe, the longest ice cores come from Antarctica. On this slide and on the next one you will see a picture of the continent of Antarctica showing the location of some of the ice cores that have been drilled and some facts about the three most important ice cores. You can pause the video Again, you can pause the video to look over the interesting details. I'm showing this slide 
to give you an idea of what a small piece of an ice core looks like. Ice cores are like tree rings. You can see what is happening from year to year. Again, you can pause the video to look over the details. To obtain data about climate, each annual ring of the ice cores must be sliced up into very thin sections, a fraction of an inch thick. In figure six, you can see a cross section backlighted and being held by a person wearing gloves. The bubbles in the ice are clearly visible. These contain a sample of the Earth's atmosphere. You can pause the video to look over the figure. There are, two, there are at least two very important things we want to know. Number one, what were the temperatures in the past? And number two, what were the levels of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the past? You can pause the video to look over the details. The primary purpose of this figure is to give you a graphic representation of what the ice core data would look like after analysis. Here we see a plot of time versus temperature for the Vostok ice core, which goes back in time about 420,000 years. We can see four previous ice ages, or glacial periods, the valleys, with a global temperature Temperatures were very cold, with temperature anomalies of about minus 8 degrees Celsius. And interglacial periods, the peaks, where global temperatures were several degrees warmer at about plus 2 degrees Celsius. These four ice ages had been described by geologists several years before the ice cores were drilled, so their discovery confirmed their findings. Notice that there is a strong correlation between glacial and interglacial events and temperature. Warmer temperatures occur during interglacial periods and colder temperatures occur during glacial periods. You can pause the video to look over the details. In the previous slide, we saw a correlation between temperature and the occurrence of ice ages over a very long period of time. This points out that the state of the Earth climate is at least in part temperature dependent. In figure 8, we can see ice core data for temperature and atmospheric levels of carbon dioxide. The top graph is temperature versus time and the bottom graph is levels of CO2 in parts per million versus time. If the levels of the atmospheric greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide are involved in global warming via the greenhouse effect, we would expect to see a correlation between temperature and the levels of carbon dioxide. What we would expect to see is when CO2 levels are high, the temperature will also be high and vice versa. When CO2 levels are low, the temperature should also be low, and indeed we do see this correlation. Both graphs go up and down in unison. The, an ice, the analysis of ice cores is complex, and there are several issues. You can read about one of these on the next slide. You can pause the video to read over my comment. Summary. What the ice cores have told us about the past climate of Earth. At no time in the past 800,000 years has the atmospheric levels of CO2 ever been higher than 280 parts per million. We are currently at 400 parts per million, and it is still going up. Ice core measurements confirm that both the magnitude and the rate of recent increases in CO2 are unprecedented over the last 800,000 years. Points in particular. 
The fastest and largest natural increase of CO2 measured in ice cores is around 20 parts per million in a 1,000 year period. The CO2 emissions by humans were 20 parts per million in the last 10 years alone. The law ice core clearly shows that CO2 and methane levels began to increase shortly after the start of the Industrial Revolution. While climate proxies are not considered to be highly reliable, highly reliable because of assumptions that must be made to produce the data, they do provide us with an upper and lower range of temperatures and greenhouse gas levels for the past 800,000 years. Topic 5. Why is it warming? Could it have a natural cause? I have heard people say it's just natural variation. It's the sun. It changes in the Earth's orbit or its volcanoes. Let's consider whether or not the changes we see occurring are just natural variation. The sun. The sun does not contribute greenhouse gases to Earth's atmosphere, but its energy, its sunlight, is the major source of heat energy for the planet. The issue is this. Is the sun putting more heat into the Earth's climate system than it has in the past? Since 1978, solar irradiance has been measured by satellites, and sunspot activity is recorded by telescopes here on Earth. Look at figure 9. The top portion of the graph that covers the last 30 to 40 years does not show any significant variation in the amount of irradiance reaching the top of the atmosphere. The exception being the portion of the curve to the right, showing a decrease in solar energy output since about 2010. If any notable effect is observed, it seems to me it would be a slight cooling trend. The bottom portion shows that sunspot activity has a high correlation with solar irradiance. These two sets of data reinforce the conclusion that the sun is not a major cause of the current global warming trend. Changes in Earth's orbit. Orbital forcing. There are at least three major ways that Earth orbit varies over the course of millennia. Its obliquity, its eccentricity, and its precession. Where the Earth is within each of these cycles has a significant effect on the amount of solar irradiance and thus warmth that the planet gets from the Sun. I will discuss the first two as the conclusion for all three is the same. Axle tail. The angle of the Earth's axle tail varies over time, ranging from a minimum of 22.1 degrees to a maximum of 24.5 degrees and then back again. It takes about 20,000 years to go from its minimum to its maximum. The current axle tilt is 23.44 degrees, roughly halfway between its extreme values. The tilt is in the decreasing phase of the cycle, headed to 22.1 degrees and will reach its minimum value around the year 11,800 A.D. The last maximum was reached in 8,700 B.C. This data suggests that the Earth orbit is in a neutral phase as far as its effect on global climate, suggesting that its current tilt is not a major cause of global warming. Earth orbit around the Sun. The shape of the Earth's orbit varies from nearly circular to a more oval shape and then back again. It takes about 100,000 years to complete this cycle. Currently, we are in an orbit of near circular, which does not bring the Earth closer to the Sun and will not do so for several thousand years.
we are in a neutral orbit, one that is not heading for an ice age and one that is not heading for global warming in several thousand years. Topic 5-3, volcanoes, a possible source of greenhouse gases. What about volcanoes? When one looks at a volcanic plume, one can easily imagine bad things happening. Here we see the eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippine Islands in 1991. It was one of the largest eruptions of the 20th century. But what is that plume cloud made of? Most of the plume is water vapor, not carbon dioxide. For this volcano, the other major gas was sulfur dioxide. It is not a greenhouse gas, but actually causes global cooling. In addition, sulfur dioxide does produce acid rain, which is very harmful to the environment. Here's what the experts say about carbon dioxide emissions from volcanoes. You can pause the video to read over the details. However, the yearly average emissions from volcanoes is a mere fraction of emissions by humans. Here's a summary of the five largest volcanoes over the last 200 years. I found that all of these were large emitters of sulfur dioxide and caused the planet to cool for varying amounts of time. Again, you can pause the video to read over the summary. Topic 6. Global Warming Potential and Radiative Forcing First of all, Global Warming Potential. We are coming back to the greenhouse gases because there is more to them than just their amount in the atmosphere. Not all greenhouse gases are created equally. Some are much more potent than others, and this aspect of their nature is accounted for in their global warming potential. You have all probably heard on the news about this, but didn't realize what it was about. You will hear a comment like, natural gas, or methane, is 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Let's see why this is so. Definition. Global warming potential is a relative measure of how much heat a certain greenhouse gas traps in the atmosphere compared to carbon dioxide. Table 4. Global warming potential. A few comments about Table 4. Carbon dioxide is used as the standard or the base from which all other greenhouse gases are measured. Notice its atmospheric lifetime is 30 to 95 years, and its global warming potential for 20 years is 1, and for 100 years also 1. It is the standard. Next, using methane as an example, its atmospheric lifetime is 12.4 years, for its 20-year global warming potential time horizon is 84 and its 100-year time horizon is 28. Most important point you need to take with you from this table is this. While carbon dioxide is by far the most abundant greenhouse gas, methane and nitrous oxide are very potent gases when it comes to the overall intensity of their greenhouse effect and their ability to trap heat energy here on the planet Earth. On the next slide are two examples of what the global warming potential is telling us. You can pause the video to read over Table 4 and the examples on the next slide. These two examples will give you a better idea of what the global warming potential is telling us. Again, you can pause the video to read over the details. Radiative forcing. 
is the earth in an energy imbalance? Definition. Radiative forcing is a measure of the difference between the incoming energy from the sun and the amount of energy leaving the earth. Satellites have been orbiting the earth since about 1978. There are satellites looking out that are measuring the amount of energy incoming from the sun and others looking in at the earth and measuring how much energy is going out. The satellite data is very complex, but it does provide an estimate of radiative forcing of 0.8 to 2.4 watts per square meter. This indicates that the Earth is keeping in more of the energy from the Sun. What we need to understand in this presentation is what is causing the extra energy to be trapped. It is like putting a heavy blanket over the planet. There are only three ways in which radiative forcing of the planet can be changed. One, changes in energy from the sun. As we saw previously, for the past 30 to 40 years, this has been ruled out. Changes in greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We have also seen in this presentation that the levels of the greenhouse gases are increasing. And number three, changes in albedo due to aerosols such as volcanic activity and cloud cover. Previously I discussed the greenhouse gases and their global warming potential. Radiative forcing data combines the global warming potential with the amounts of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This type of analysis gives climate researchers a way to determine which component of the Earth's climate system are responsible for increasing or decreasing the Earth's surface temperature. Agents in red and to the right, i.e. the greenhouse gases, are those that increase the trapping of the sun's energy. Notice the two red bars at the top. Agents in blue and to the left, such as clouds, are those that decrease the trapping of the sun's energy. You can pause the video to look over figure 13. Details on radiative forcing. Number one, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxide, and the halocarbons are the major cause of the Earth's increasing energy imbalance. Number two, aerosols and clouds counteract radiative forcing by reflecting of the sun's energy back into space. The net between those that increase RF and those that decrease RF is 2.3 watts per square meter. If we continue to emit greenhouse gases, the RF or energy imbalance will continue to increase and the earth will continue to warm history of radiative forcing values. In 1750, the Earth was in an energy balance. Incoming energy equaled outgoing energy. Zero watts per square meter. In 2005, it increased to 1.6 watts per square meter. In 2014, the most current measurement, we are at 2.3 watts per meter squared. Future projections are for 2.6 to 8.5 watts per square meter. This depends on the choices we make in the amount of fossil fuels that we burn. Topic 7. How much CO2 are we emitting and putting into the Earth's climate system? In Figure 14, we can see data for CO2 emissions from 1850 with projections to 2030. As shown on the graph, human CO2 emissions from the burning of fossil fuels has increased at a fairly steady rate since 1850, with larger increases since 1950. In 2010, we emitted about 37 
billion tons of CO2. In 2030, projections for CO2 emissions could reach 45 billion tons per year. We are emitting very large amounts of CO2 into the climate system each year. Let me put this in human terms. I chose a nice round number of 40 billion tons per year. What does that look like in human terms? There are over 7 billion people on the planet. For the sake of simplicity, let me assume that the average person weighs about 100 pounds. What would be the total weight? 7 billion people weigh about 700 billion pounds. We are putting about 40 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere each year. How much is that in pounds? 40 billion tons of CO2 is equal to 80,000 billion pounds per year. This means that the amount of CO2 that we are putting into the Earth's climate system is about 114 times larger, or 11,000 percent, than the total weight of the human race. Do you get the feeling we might be overdoing it just a bit? Where does all that CO2 go? Well, 30 percent is absorbed by the ocean. 30% is stored in the land, and 40% remains in the atmosphere. The IPCC estimates that since 1750, the cumulative human emissions of carbon dioxide is about 1,890 gigatons, or almost 2 trillion tons. A large amount of CO2 in the oceans has resulted in ocean acidification which could have a dramatic effect on some marine life forms. Where does all the heat energy go? In figure 16, we can see that 93% of the heat energy gained by the planet has gone into the oceans. The other 7% has been absorbed by the land surfaces, the atmosphere, and into the melting of ice. You can pause the video to look over the details. Up to this point, I have talked mostly about carbon dioxide. However, the other greenhouse gases are also significant factors in global warming. In Figure 17, we can see how the emissions of the greenhouse gases have increased since 1990. Carbon dioxide emissions account for 77% of the total, and the other greenhouse gases account for 23%. In 1990, world total greenhouse gas emissions were at about 35 billion metric tons. In 2010, total world global greenhouse gas emissions were at about 45 billion metric tons. Those are huge numbers. Here is something for all of us to think about. What has happened on the Earth since the start of the Industrial Revolution? In 1750, at the start of the Industrial Revolution, the world population was less than 1 billion. By 1950, it had reached about 2.5 billion. By 2015, we were at 7 billion and growing. By 2050, the estimate is for 9 billion. The use of the planet's energy resources is being driven by the growth of our population and our desire to improve our living standard. The world average per capita greenhouse gas emissions is about 5.6 tons per year per person. This means that for each person born, an additional 5.6 tons per year of greenhouse gases will be emitted into the Earth's climate system.
Topic 8, Human CO2 and Greenhouse Gas Emissions, Parts Per Million in the Atmosphere. In addition to temperature data records and the amounts of the fossil fuels we are using, we also need to monitor the amounts of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere. There are several laboratories around the world that do this, but the benchmark site and the one I want to talk about is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Mauna Loa Observatory, located on the Big Island of Hawaii. I'm showing the next few slides just to give you a feel for where MLO is located and a look at their carbon dioxide analysis equipment. You can pause the slide to look over the details. Figure 21, you can see the carbon dioxide collection and analysis equipment. You can pause the video to read over the details. 8-2 the best data on atmospheric levels of CO2. The following chart plots the monthly mean atmospheric carbon dioxide levels at Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. The data is from 1958 to November 2015, a period of 57 years. Since 1958, there has been a steady increase in CO2 from 310 parts per million to 401 parts per million. That is an increase of 29%. That is also an average of about 1.6 parts per million per year. In 2014, CO2 levels in the atmosphere were increasing at about 2.3 parts per million, and it is expected to increase as we use more fossil fuels. Here's a closer look. You'll notice that zigzag pattern on the graph. On the next slide I uh, explain to you why it has this zigzag pattern. It's very interesting. You can pause the video, look over the details. 8-3 the best data for greenhouse gas emissions. These graphs show changes in the annual greenhouse gas index between 1979 and 2015. There are 214 stations in 51 different countries collecting data relevant to worldwide greenhouse gas atmospheric levels. The levels of the three major greenhouse gases are steadily increasing. As a result, we should expect radiative forcing, or energy imbalance, to increase and cause an increase in the Earth's global mean surface temperature. Topic 9. Last topic. The IPCC's Representative Concentration Pathways Future Projections. When fossil fuels, such as oil, coal, and natural gas, are burned to produce energy or make consumer goods, the major byproduct is carbon dioxide along with some methane and nitrous oxide. We are using very large amounts of these fuels, and as a result, very large amounts of carbon dioxide are being put into the Earth's climate system. What are the consequences of doing this? Here is a quick summary. The release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere enhances the greenhouse effect, which in turn traps more of the sun's energy here on the planet. This can be best understood by the global warming potential and radiative forcing data shown in this presentation. As a result, the planet will continue to warm. If we continue using massive amounts of fossil fuel, the planet will continue to heat up. The more we use, the hotter it will get. It seems to me we should turn this situation around. How can we do that? 
The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has chosen four representative pathways as scenarios that lay out an outline of what needs to be done to reach a certain goal. The names of scenarios have been given come from radiative forcing numbers, which I discussed previously. The four scenarios are RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, and 8.5. The numbers are what the radiative forcing or energy imbalance will be in the year 2100. Bear in mind that we are currently at 2.3 watts per square meter. RCP 4.5 indicates that the energy imbalance will reach 4.5 watts per square meter by 2100 if we follow that scenario. Likewise, RCP 6.0 indicates that the energy imbalance will reach 6.0 watts per square meter by 2100 if we follow that scenario. I hope it is clear that these high RF values indicate that the Earth will get warmer and warmer if we don't stop using fossil fuels. Here's the details on the scenarios. The representative concentration pathways are based on their radiative forcing numbers that will be reached by 2100, a mere 85 years from now. For the 2.6 scenario, we will have to reduce our use of fossil fuels, oil, coal, and natural gas to near zero levels to keep the global temperature from increasing a significant amount. This can be accomplished by expanding alternative energy such as solar, wind, and others. For scenarios 4.5 and 6.0, these are intermediate pathways. Both will require a substantial decrease in our usage of fossil fuels. The amount we decrease will determine the resulting radiative forcing numbers and as a consequence the global mean surface temperature. 8.5 scenario is the business as usual scenario. It is what we are currently doing. This will increase the radiative forcing to 8.5 watts per square meter by 2100. The most likely outcome of this will be a very warm planet. Table 5 summarizes the IPCC's projected temperature outcomes for the four scenarios. The temperatures in this table are temperature anomalies. On the next slide, I give you a quick review of how to change temperature anomalies into degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. Let's consider two of these scenarios in detail. 2.6, which is the best case scenario, and 8.5, which is the worst case scenario. For 2.6, we will have to reduce our dependency on fossil fuels to near zero by the year 2100. If we can do this, we will be able to keep the global mean surface temperature of the planet at about 1 degree Celsius. Be sure to notice the range of uncertainty shown in Table 5. If you would like to know how we can do this, I suggest you read the 20, November 2015 issue of National Geographics entitled Cool It, the Climate Issue. This entire issue is about global warming, and it contains a great deal of information you will understand. You can probably get it at your local library. At the end of this video, I will give you this reference once again. 8.5 is known as the business as usual scenario. If we continue to use fossil fuels at our current rate or increase them as is the most likely outcome because of the increasing population of the planet. The temperature in 2100 could reach 3.7 degrees Celsius, which is almost 7 degrees Fahrenheit, for the mean, or if we are unlucky, it could get to 4.8 degrees Celsius, or almost 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Do you understand what this really means? I will talk in terms of degrees Fahrenheit because most of us can relate to that. 
consider a global mean surface temperature increase of almost 7 degrees Fahrenheit by the year 2100. For every day and for every place on the planet, the average temperature will be 6.7 degrees higher than it is today. So on a spring day, when it's a 50 degrees Fahrenheit, now the average spring day in 2100 would be about 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that sounds better, but if it is now 95 degrees in the summer, then in 2100, the average summer day on the planet would be about 102 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is for the mean. If we are unlucky with an increase of 8 to 9 degrees Fahrenheit, that summer average day could reach 104 degrees. And it will continue to increase until we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. In my opinion, and in the opinion of the experts, the planet's ecosystems, the ones that support our existence, will be severely damaged by these high levels of temperatures. Bear in mind that the planet has been much cooler for several thousands of years, and it has adjusted to those temperatures. A sudden change, such as the one we are going through now, will have a large negative effect on the planet's life forms, and as a result, on us. Here is a review for converting temperature anomalies into degrees Celsius and degrees Fahrenheit. You can pause the video to take a closer look. Based on what you have seen here, is global warming a hoax or is it real? You decide. Either way, everyone on this planet has a front row seat. Here are two publications you should read. Number one, National Geographic's magazine, the November 2015 issue, entitled Cool It, the Climate Issue. This entire issue addresses global warming, what is happening, and what we can do. You can probably find this issue at your local library. The second recommendation is Merchants of Doubt. This book documents how a handful of scientists and pundits are creating confusion about global warming and who is behind creating that confusion. There are also videos on YouTube, and I did watch several of them. However, they do not do the book justice. So, read the book. It is a wake-up call for all of us. You can probably get it through your library. I did. Closing comments. I would ask all of you to become educated about global warming. Don't listen to the guy down the street, comments in the newspaper, or the pundits on TV. You can use the keywords in my outline to start your personal study. I would also recommend that you look at the IPCC's website. I have given you the address below. It is a scientific document and a very tough read, but each chapter has an executive summary at the beginning that is only three to four pages long. You should at least read them, then decide. Thank you for listening. I sincerely hope you have learned something and are now more informed about global warming.